there is this video that is trending on the social media platform about our sister, uh, Dr. Chimamanda Adichie. Yes, if you don't know, I think she's a doctor. I'm very sure about that, but I think she's fighting her position as a professor. Okay, but for now, let's address her as Dr. Mrs. Uh, Chimamanda Adichie. Okay, so she's somebody that is that's has spoken that's taking a lot of recognition around the world and there was a particular video i saw about her telling the the british or would i say the colonial masters to return what they stole from us i was very happy i was really really happy that video gave me a lot of who goosebumps but uh, i said let me share it to my family and friends on social media so that they can see that yes we have some persons who will still damn or ought to say the truth no matter how little it is so, so let me come and share it with us so that we can see what really transpired and really see what we can tell our sister that she's doing a very nice job okay so guys i'm gonna allow, allow us to watch this video please our advice us to please take our popcorn sit down relax and hear what she has to say but please if she's wrong or she's right please tell me in the comment section because for me i feel what she did was the best thing she could have done but i don't know for that you know one man's miss and man's, as they say one man's miss and another man's poison so i don't know what somebody else will say but if you think she's wrong please tell me in the comment section so that we'll know what to say about it okay thank you so much for always watching my channel coming to watch my videos i really do appreciate us for those of us who have not followed me on our social media platform please i beg you do the needful so that i can Push this ministry to the permanent okay? Let's just watch this video and hear what our sister said. A woman told me a story about her elderly father. It was early in the war, and they were in their Biafran hometown, feeling relatively safe because the war seemed far away. Then suddenly they heard the loud, terrifying sounds of bombing very close to them, and they knew that they had only minutes to leave their home and run into the interior for safety before the Nigerian soldiers arrived. The elderly father was a wealthy man, but the only thing he rushed to take with him was his ikenga, a piece of wood, a beautifully carved piece of wood. But it wasn't just a piece of wood. It was also the repository of spiritual meaning. The Ikenga represented his chi, his personal spirit, as well as his ancestors, his guardian angels. I was struck by this story. This man, facing the possibility of never seeing his home again, chose the thing that mattered most to him. Of course, he cared about his material possessions, but he believed that those could eventually be replaced while his Ikenga was irreplaceable. There are Ikengas in various museums all over the world today, and it is easy to forget as we stare and admire them behind cold and clinical glass barriers that these are objects that are religious, spiritual, sacred. Art lives in history, and history lives in art. Much of what we call African art are also documents that tell stories. Some are literal in the storytelling, like the beautifully ornate Benin stool that was sent to the Oba of Benin by his people when he was exiled by the British, and which he looked at and immediately could deduce from the carvings the state of his British plundered land. Other sculptures and carvings are more metaphorical. They speak to the dignity of a people, to their worldview, to their aspirations. Some of the early Christian missionaries across the African continent were very keen on destroying African art, carved African deities, which they told the Africans were just magic. I cannot help but wryly wonder what could be more magical than the story of a man who dies and then magically rises again. A man who also manages to magically give his body as bread. And I say this, by the way, as a newly returned Roman Catholic. The point is that belief systems vary. And as long as they feed the spiritual needs of a people, they're valid. We cannot be dismissive of a belief system merely because it is unfamiliar to us. 
just as we cannot be dismissive of a history because we are uncomfortable with it. So I'd like to tell a small story about a Nigerian woman who's married to a Belgian and has lived in Belgium for many years. She said once that she was shocked that her son, while being taught Belgian history, was taught nothing about Congo. They teach my son in school that he must help the poor Africans, she said, but they don't teach him about what Belgium did in Congo. Now, if her son does not learn that the modern Congo state began 100 years ago as the personal property of a brutal Belgian king who was desperate to get wealthy from ivory and rubber, if her son does not learn that the hands of Congolese people were chopped off with rusty axes for not producing enough resources to meet a king's greed, if her son does not learn that the Belgian government later ruled Congo with a deliberate emphasis on not producing an educated class, if this young Belgian boy knows nothing of these incidents, then at some point they will perhaps no longer have happened because the past, after all, is the past because we collectively acknowledge that it is so. It is not that Europe has denied its colonial history. That would be too crude. It is instead that Europe has developed a way of telling the story of its colonial history that ultimately seeks to erase that history. The former French Prime Minister Nicolas Sarkozy gave a now infamous speech in Senegal in which he said, I have not come to deny mistakes or crimes. Mistakes were made and crimes committed. But no one can ask of the generations of today to expiate this crime perpetrated by past generations. This is central to the story that Europe tells itself about its colonial history. It is a story that basically says, yes, colonialism happened, but, and whatever comes after the but is the focus of the story. What the focus on the but does is that it absolves. It frees Europe of responsibility of a significant and traceable connection to the African present, and it allows Europe the glow of charity. But the truth, is that the past does not merely tell us what happened yesterday, it also illuminates what happens today. If we acknowledge that present day Europe is shaped by the Renaissance of 600 years ago, by the Enlightenment of 300 years ago, then surely we cannot say that what happened merely 100 years ago in Africa no longer matters. It matters. We are gathered today in this reconstructed palace, a beautiful place, but also a place that represents Germany's nostalgia for imperial times. When Kaiser William II lived here, German troops were killing children, women, and men in Southwest Africa. This building says that German history matters, even in a romanticized form. The history of Africa and Asia and Latin America must matter as well. We cannot pick and choose which histories and which points of view still matter, because to do this would be an ugly exercise of brute power. And speaking of power, here's a headline I just read in a German publication. The headline says, where do Africa's treasures belong? Now imagine this headline differently. Imagine if it said, where do Germany's treasures belong? It would be a redundant question because of course, Germany's treasures belong in Germany. But the question would never even be asked because there would be no circumstance in which it would be because of power. And so it seems to me that what we are fundamentally grappling with in this space, in all of these questions about the Humboldt Forum is power unequal power, how we navigate unequal power relations. And there's always been to me something shabby about unequal power relations. The victory feels colorless, almost unearned. So I spoke of Belgium 
and its colonial history, but what of Germany and its colonial history? Do school children here learn about Namibia, what was called the German South West Africa? Do school children know that 100,000 Herero people were murdered by the Germans? Do they know of the wells that were poisoned? Do they know of the women used as sex slaves and others as slaves in German camps? Do they know of the Nama people killed and of the Maji Maji revolt in German East Africa? And why should they know? Because to tell only part, one part of a story is essentially to lie. A story is true only when it is complete. Germany is Beethoven, and Germany is Bath, and Germany is also its colonial atrocities that have resulted in hundreds of African skulls being stored in the basement of museums here in Berlin, skulls of men whose spirits cannot be at rest, men who could well have been my great-grandfather had I happened to have been born in Eastern rather than Western Africa. It is only fair to fully own all of the stories of Germany. All countries have parts of their pasts that they're not proud of, that they would rather forget. But it takes courage to face those parts and bring in some light. And this is a time for courage. The courage to hear dissenting voices, such as those of the people who are outside right now protesting, they should be heard and included. They have valid concerns. The courage not merely to say, we take your criticism, but to follow it with action. The courage to say, we were wrong. The courage to say about art acquired illicitly, this is not ours, tell us what to do with it. The courage to do provenance work and to actively use local knowledge. The courage to act and to act now and not become crippled by endless planning and endless talking. The courage to believe that it can be better. We cannot change the past, but we can change our blindness to the past. And why, by the way, is the term ethnological used for art from certain parts of the world and not art for other parts of the world? And then in discussing some of this art that we term ethnological, and I would argue that the language itself already suggests a hierarchy of value, when we talk about this art that was stolen, we're told that they cannot be returned to Africa, for example, because Africans will not take good care of them. It is not merely condescending to say, I cannot return what I stole from you because you will not take good care of it. It is also lacking in basic logic. Since when has the basis of ownership been taking good care of what is owned? This position is paternalistic arrogance of the most stunning sort. It does not matter whether Africans or Asians or Latin Americans can take care of the art stolen from them. What matters is that it is theirs. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,